Terminator versus Avatar, Mark Fisher once invoked the neo-reactionary accelerationist philosopher Nick Land as our Nietzsche, as the enemy the left needs. Well, my guest today, Daniel Tutt, argues otherwise, that it is in fact Nietzsche who is our Nietzsche, and it is Nietzsche who is the enemy the left needs, not simply as someone to be cast out, but to be worked through, such that we can pass through Nietzsche's temptations, be unwelcome guests at his table of higher men, and that on the way we find ourselves on the other side of Nietzsche, of a kind of philosophical awakening towards a new Marxist clarity. Daniel's latest book, how to read like a parasite why the left got high on nietzsche is out now with repeater on paperback and audiobook and first and foremost i want to welcome daniel thank you so much for coming back onto the show it's my pleasure i'm, I'm happy to be back on the zero repeater channel um great to be here adam thanks for you know putting this together it's very exciting thanks for Absolutely. taking reading the book and and everything like that so i like that intro i mean we can talk about everything you just said but it's very good Let's just start off in terms of the, the theoretical, des the, what is the desire named How to Read Like a Parasite? Why did you feel that this book was so necessary and what was the concept, what's the scene that it's arriving upon, which is already quite bloodied in a way? Sure. Um, well, it's written from the perspective of a kind of lover of Nietzsche, um, written from the perspective of somebody that first read Nietzsche in a restless state of existence uh, and my sort of late teens, early 20s, you know, and um, encountered this, uh, you know, lightning bolt philosophy, which was forceful, which was um, uh, rarefied, inspiring, something that got me out of my seat moving around. Um, uh, really, you know, Nietzsche, in a sense, uh, helped me understand this sort of Socratic uh, maxim of self-examination. Uh, but he adds a, a sort of twist to the Socratic maxim that drives philosophy of knowing thyself, right? Which is uh, knowing thyself is also a task uh, of an adventure that is dangerous. And so Nietzsche, Nietzsche calls you to participate in the creation of something. And um, I, I heeded the call, you know? Um, and I think that many, many people have on the right, the left, the liberal center, you name it. And um, so I became a kind of Nietzschean in some way um, for many years and um, before I encountered Marx. Um, <clears throat> so immediately I was immersed in Nietzschean literature, uh, very moved by Gilles Deleuze, very um, enamored by various Nietzschean, uh, especially from the French scene, but I think others as well. And part of what animates the desire of this book is my discovery of a sort of different way of looking at Nietzsche through the lens of politics, right? And part of that is a story of the translation of Nietzsche that I was exposed to through Walter Kaufman. And this is sort of famously a depoliticized version of the, of the philosopher. And so I really read Nietzsche, Adam, without an, an awareness of his politics without an awareness of, I mean, I knew that there was a kind of esoteric level or dimension to the philosopher, but I didn't really know that it had a political edge. In fact, if anything, I thought that Nietzsche, when he commented on politics, that those were the most marginal parts of his philosophy. So encountering perspectives on Nietzsche from a more Marxist uh, perspective, Eric Hobsbawm, Antonio Gramsci, Domenico Lucerto, Gajor Glukac, and a number of other thinkers um, alerted me to, because you see, I was also interested in understanding Marxist theory, but I sort of have in recent years been interested in historical contextualization of philosophers and what actually drives the philosophical project of a given philosopher, right? This, this sort of historical materialist context, context is super, central to my book. And so part of what my book is, is a unearthing of Nietzsche's social, cultural, political context, what drove his thought, and a sort of uh, claim, right, that there, is, that there is a political agenda at work, despite the esotericism, and that we benefit from reading him um, in this way. So the desire is sort of coming at a thinker who you were seduced enamored, in love with to some extent, 
but then you sort of grew to understand in a deeper way and actually uh, now see this philosopher in a more productive way as sort of intention in a sort of dialectical tension, even with your values, your goals, your objectives on the left, your interests in emancipation. And so I, I began to read Nietzsche as an antagonist, right? And we can talk about what I mean by parasite and parasitical, because a parasite is just a form of, par of reading. Um, it's that, but it's also a homage to the idea of, of the parasite that Nietzsche actually writes about a fair amount. I mean, well, I think if you, you do well to go for sort of the appeals of Nietzsche, especially because he's also he so often put aside alongside Marx and Freud as the founders of the hermeneutics of suspicion. Which, to, just to sum it up in a phrase, Nietzsche is one of those thinkers that when someone puts forward a position, he responds with, "Well, you would say that, wouldn't you?" Because you are a product of all these coalitions of forces, these histories of the psyche, these histories of lineages, uh, breeding, which is a technical term for nature, of course. And one of the things I find so refreshing about your book is that it does this, it does it, it does what Nietzsche wants to do to you, to himself. Well, saying, well, Nietzsche, would, no, yes, Nietzsche, you would say this, wouldn't you? Because here is your class background, here is your, you know, your your pension you get at the age of twenty nine. Here is your ability to go wander around Lake Garda, the Upper Engadine, and the like. And I think this method of reading is, is something we should definitely get into first and foremost, which is, which is you know, have we been reading Nietzsche all wrong? How are we reading him wrong? And Chris, unpack these ideas of the latent politics have been displaced uh, through yes. our history of receiving Nietzsche. Yeah, um, part of what the argument of the book is, is that Nietzsche has performed a certain wide-scale cultural imprint and you know the the very um idea of values obviously has a neo-kantian german thrust why when we talk about our own personal value sphere and things of this nature which of course later becomes popularized in self-help and things like that but part of that we owe to nietzsche um i would argue part of how we how we understand individual suffering in capitalism, we owe to Nietzsche's concept of resentiment, right? So it's, it's in my opinion, right, that Nietzsche and Nietzscheanism, the various forms of his influence, are sort of profound, right, and sort of wide ranging. Um, now, <clears throat> with that understanding, um, the predominant way we've come to understand the philosopher has largely been through sort of reading method that argues that meaning and the determination of a kind of sensible core to all of his concepts is sort of not really possible. You know, Jacques Derrida, the famous French philosopher, famously said this. This is owed, this, this idea that Nietzsche is sort of indeterminate, that he's decentered, and so on. Um, Derrida famously uh, writes, uh, I don't know, dozens of pages about a late journal reflection of Nietzsche, which simply says, I have forgotten my umbrella. And Derrida uses this random phrase, which Nietzsche could have just said as like a meaningless phrase. And Derrida says, well, actually, this may contain some kind of secret esoteric key to Nietzsche's views that uh, reveals some totality or some whole to his concepts, or it could mean nothing. And so there's this ambiguity that a lot of philosophers have read Nietzsche. But I'm not as interested in that ambiguity-based, decentered, indeterminate reading. Because I, one of the arguments that I make is that if politics, and by politics I mean a concerted anti-egalitarian agenda, is at the heart of this philosopher's work, well, that actually appears across all of his various ideas and concepts. And so you can sort of piece together a unity of Nietzsche, right? And that's sort of what I, what I attempt to sketch out, both by contextualizing him in a historical fashion, um, not only through where he stood on the political spectrum, but by reference to the epistolary and to the Nachlis and to the, the letters, to the exchanges of Nietzsche with his contemporaries. So all of these questions of anti-Semitism, anti-socialism, um, slavery, um, his opposition to different forms of egalitarian expression, uh, 
Because you see, Nietzsche confessed all along that he has politics at his center. He also suggests this, right? He says, I'm interested in great politics. So on the one hand, I was sort of frustrated, right? That there's this idea of decentering those politics. And also because, you know, um, Lukács, right? Help me understand that when we read Nietzsche through a political lens as socialists, as communists, as anarchists, as leftists across the board, I'm not just going to say as socialists, I'm just saying, let's say on the left, right? Adam, part of what I, what I want to say here is that we benefit from reading Nietzsche that way, where he doesn't become somebody that must be canceled as a reactionary, but actually becomes somebody who's a secret antagonist to our desires for universalism, for equality. Like he gets on the inside of the left and that's why he must be read. But what, what I'm trying to say is that the left has missed out on that desire of Nietzsche by decentering him. So it's a more productive engagement to see him as an enemy. But by an enemy, that doesn't mean that he must be uh, uh, discarded because that actually would mean that you just give Nietzsche to the right. And I'm not really interested in giving Nietzsche to the right. I think that he has to be worked through by the left. So that, that would be one way to say that. I mean, it's, it's one of the ways I think that Nietzsche is such an antagonist to our desires in a way as leftist is the one of my main contentions with Nietzsche is the way he frames his entire project in many aspects, particularly around Dusbeck Zarathustra, and to some extent, Twilight of the Idols, as being against revenge. And seeing, you know, I mean, there are, I think there's some interesting stuff, in it, particularly about time. So it, I did my thesis on Nietzsche and Hegel on time, but um, particularly around the idea of taking revenge against time. But then when you, when you center politics in that, sometimes I can't be thinking that, well, what's wrong with, re with revenge, in the, at least in the sense of, reacting to those circumstances isn't revenge isn't the resistance to domination the actual thing that eternally recurs and that's why i think the most interesting thing i mean there's some great writing on this i know i know you deal with a lot of howard kegel's work there's a paper called um, also spruck zapata, uh, zapata which is kind of a, a pseudo nietzschean reading of um i say pseudo it's not no full-blooded nietzsche reading of um, the zapatistas and the black panthers and the like but i think this is where the the actual the the recentering of politics can actually decenter some of the Nietzsche's own aspects, even against himself. But to talk about a paradigm example of recentering, I really want to focus on the concept of Rosante Mont particularly, because sure. it, it's one of those concepts from Nietzsche which doesn't have as many different attempts at definition as, say, like, you know, the eternal return, when sometimes it's a, a test of your metal, sometimes it's cosmological, like in the nut class. But Rosante Mont. That is one which you can just grab hold of it and say, "This is what he says," you know. And it's one of the most it's one of the most proactive concepts still used discursively. I yeah. think. Yes. Yes, and of course the the concept was already in the in the ether uh, of of intellectual life when Nietzsche uh, latches on to it. Um, so Nietzsche is a polemicist, but as a polemicist, you know, the subtitle of Genealogy of Morality is a polemic. It's, but it's always a question of who he's a polemicist against. Nietzsche says that I enter into politics and I never side with the victors. So Nietzscheanism is, is what we could call, to use a kind of maybe fancy term, is a trasformismo. It's kind of an Italian concept, right, that Gramsci works with, which is that Nietzsche latches on to any political expression and kind of molds it in a particular way, right? And that's actually why Nietzsche exists across the political spectrum and why he's not reducible just to one expression and why he can influence mul a multiplicity of political expressions. So that's very cunning on his part, right? It's a kind of um, subterranean form of politics, right? And so how, my question with Rousan Timont is how does it appear in the political ether, um, on, in liberal, democratic societies such as ours and so on in particular. Um, part of what I argue here is that, you know, uh, Nietzsche was also a reader in political economy. Slave morality, for example, is also a confrontation with the historical reality of the ending of chattel slavery. And the kind of undergirding argument of slave morality is that new physiological and psychological forms of enslavement will 
and are happening as a result of the wake of the disillusion. So therefore, Nietzsche becomes a strange thinker of what happens after abolition. So if you are on the left and you are for abolition, right? And many folks are for abolition in various forms, say the carceral uh, complex in the United States, prison abolition, for example. Nietzsche can be somebody that you think with vis-a-vis -vis that abolition project. However, my warning, my contribution to that thinking with Nietzsche, because I would never want to shut down somebody's thinking with Nietzsche. My contribution would be to understand the precise way that Nietzsche thought with the abolitionist movements of his time and the precise way that Nietzsche thought with um, the movement for universal suffrage of all, me of all men to vote in Europe, for example. Where did he fall on that? What was his comments on slavery? What is the meaning of the continuation of different psychological forms of slavery? Because at the heart of Nietzsche, is a sort of noble interest, you could say, in fostering a subjectivity that is radically liberated. So Nietzsche is a thinker of a particular form of liberation. And if you don't perform a careful reading of Nietzsche's intentions, of the architecture of his concepts, I worry, Adam, that you end up, unbeknownst to yourself maybe, advocating that particular form of liberation that Nietzsche was after, which has these um, elitist presuppositions built into them. So with all of that said as background, on Rosantimont, unlike, say, Kierkegaard, right, who understands Rosantimont as a kind of cultural um, affect that can affect anybody in the post-French Revolutionary age, the age of reflection, Nietzsche's more precise about Rosantimont in my estimation and in my reading. In his development of the critique of genealogy, um, Rosantimont all really, you could say, stems from the effects of egalitarian movements from below. And my argument is that when it is invoked in political discourse, it has a particular function, a design that's built into it, okay? And the question for left Nietzscheans is the following. Can you escape that design? Like Deleuze invokes Rosantimont a lot. It therefore is a question as to whether Deleuze can really move beyond Nietzsche's design and intent, you see. But let's talk about what Nietzsche's intent with the concept is in my reading. It is meant to cure or mute the problem of what Nietzsche calls extreme suffering in modern life. And therefore, it has a kind of implicit class application. Nietzsche knew through his reading of political economy, which was extensive, that there is a class of laborers who are to be understood as a neo-slave class, but the egalitarian movements of socialism in particular, but other forms of egalitarian movements, risk upsetting this balance of uh, laborers who could otherwise be happy in their toil. So you see immediately, Nietzsche's not saying something vulgar regarding the plebeian class that must toil, like Marxist proletariat. He's not saying that um, uh, they themselves are the problem of Rosantimont. He's saying that Rosantimont emerges when socialist and pastoral discourses instruct that class to not be content with their situation. And so therefore Nietzsche becomes obsessed with disturbing the ranking order. He's obsessed with that in a complex way because on the one hand, capitalism already disturbs the true expression of physiological ranking for Nietzsche. So Nietzsche has a praxis which is trying to restore a better balance of ranking vis-a-vis physiological difference, psychological difference, and so on. But the left, you could say, particularly socialism, aims to totally disrupt all of that. And so I argue that that creates a crisis. And this is tied to Nietzsche's concept of nihilism as well. And so Rosantimont, when it is invoked, plays a certain discursive function 
and I, I show different examples of liberal Nietzscheans, left Nietzscheans, and others when they use the concept. My argument is basically that it doesn't help us build solidarity with actually oppressed groups. Because what it really does is end up, it ends up fortifying a sort of Schmidtian, you know, Carl Schmidt, the famous Nazi jurist, had this idea that politics only begins when you have what he calls the friend enemy distinction take place. And I think that Rosantiman has a problem built into it as a concept. Because when you assign it either to an individual or to a group, my argument is that you, unbeknownst to yourself, you sort of make that group ineligible for solidarity with your project. And that concerns me as a socialist, um, because I think that liberalism is happy to circumscribe groups and cast off groups and portray the world in a certain way, whereas socialism needs to build large-scale class coalitions and things like that. So whenever we, so that's a bit of it. I mean, the other thing here, Adam, is like, I feel that the concept of Rosantiment, especially when you assign it to politics, can be better used, better served by referring to resentment as opposed to Rosantiment, because I see Rosantiment as a sort of um, more pernicious form of resentment in some, in some way. It's a kind of overwhelming confluence of negative affects that weigh the subject down in profound ways. Why not use resentment? Resentment is something that is common, is to be expected. Like, for example, I think politics should be about complaint and re like resentments are real, right? So the question of politics is one of sublimating resentments. When you accuse a group or an individual of being of resentiment, the question becomes you set a very high bar for them to overcome their condition. So that, that concerns me as a political thinker. Um, so you see my point, it sort of is a, it's a troubling idea, but I wonder what you think. I mean, in terms of the, it, it seems to some extent that your critique also sends us at, again, at sort of applying sort of the Nietzschean, or you would say that to itself, at least in the sense of resentment in it's discursive function providing a kind of fixity to the subject position as being in resentment actually embodies some of those same mechanisms of, in, in, in a sense, to use a term from Lukács, reification. I mean, in, in terms of swapping out, I mean, to, yeah, it's, it is kind of hard to break out resentment from its discursive usage, because how does one demonstrate that other than by you know, doing this kind of Nietzschean affirmation that my grievances make me stronger or something like that? I mean, in regards to Rosantemon as a psycho psychologization, there's that lingering thing with, I mean, Nietzsche's famous, you know, philosophizing of a hammer also refers to the hammer used to test for like tuberculosis, you know, the hammer to tap the ref reflexes. He uses aphorisms because aphorisms are the manner of medical thinking. He's a philologist, you know, it's um, aphorisms that, that the first person of aphorisms, of course, was Hippocrates, the Hippocrat of the Hippocratic Oath fame. And so, when it comes to the question of lingering resentment, it actually it depends on how one ontologizes it. If I uh, I I agree with you in terms of the pathologization of a rigid category of of diagnostic reasoning, but then again, when it comes to uh, an ontology of like the forces within the psyche, do they get backed up by certain obstacles? Is that necessarily something which we need to die on the hill of Nietzsche for? I mean, that psychodynamics is not necessarily restricted to Nietzsche, and historicization can help us frame its political uses. But then again, maybe that's an apolitical reading of, of the, the dynamics of forces, which you can find in everything from Schelling to Freud. Yeah, I would say that's a great point, because this is why we can't examine Nietzschean concepts in isolation from one another also, right? Because if you incorporate Nietzsche's mm. community, community building objectives, um, which I read mostly as a, as a quite kind of mm. Manichean form of ethics. Like for a left Nietzschean like Deleuze, when he wrote Logic of Sense, which is my favorite Deleuze text, uh, you'll notice at a certain point in that text, he basically says the revolutionary is beyond the, the men of resentiment, right? And there is therefore a bar that is set 
for overcoming resentiment. Therefore, the political question is always has to be, what are the conditions for overcoming resentiment? Now that itself um, adds a kind of spiritual and psychological objective and itinerary to any leftist project, which itself I have no problem with. Where I do see problems though, right, is when the philosopher arrogates a certain ethical or moral, even though the Nietzschean wouldn't call it moral, um, circumspection of assigning groups to be of or not of Rosantimont. In other words, what is the basis of the determination of who the men of Rosantimont are in our time? That becomes a sociological and political judgment that's made. And it's that judgment that I think Nietzsche calls us to make. And it is that judgment that I worry about. You see, I hope that makes sense. Um, who is to say, you see my point? Um, who is, because the right, we already know the targets of Rosentiment for the right, right? And those are false targets. They're racist targets, like the black welfare queen. The right used to say that in the 80s and 90s. It's a racist, false target, or even attacks on trans people, false targets. So as class conscious Marxists, what are our targets? Who are our enemies? And now Marx teaches us that our enemies are not to be understood in a personalized way. Capitalism is a field of impersonal domination. At the same time, capitalism is also a site where existing domination occurs day in and day out. There's a whole class of managers and bureaucrats that have to enforce adherence to increasing the working hours of the day and things of this nature. So while we should never personalize those processes, right? At the same time, from a Marxist class lens, we can, I think, diagnose certain class formations and subjectivities that are more prone to resentments, such as, for example, the petit bourgeois position. It's obvious why they would be. Well, precisely because if resentiment largely is driven by envy, and most right-wing readers of Nietzsche will reduce the idea of resentiment to envy. You can see that the logic of envy would paralyze the petit bourgeois from what? From having transformative solidarity with the interests of the working class. That's my interest, right? So if Marx's premonition that the overcoming of capitalism requires the development of working class interest and solidarity, you can see how the petit bourgeois would be sort of a barrier to that. And part of that barrier is an interrogation of their own envy. So Nietzsche is calling us to look at this. And so I would read him as a provocateur, but I would warn against a construal of a conception of the situation as Manichean or as divided between this nebulous class. So we always have to, that's why class analysis and Nietzscheanism is so central for me, Adam, you know, and why it only really works when you fuse it like that, if that makes sense, right? Um, because we do need to work through, I mean, this is why Freud matters. Freud, in some sense, gives us a far more sophisticated means for thinking collective resentments than does Nietzsche. In part because Nietzsche has a political baggage to his concept of resentiment that I think the left has to be aware of that baggage, right? Um, because again, I read Nietzsche as a kind of community building thinker. Nietzsche's building a praxis. Nietzsche's building uh, a calling. Like uh, Lou Salome says, uh, Nietzsche does not write to convince. Nietzsche writes to convert. So, uh, that's seductive. To be converted to something is seductive. But once you're in the inside of the community, what do you do? And that's, 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 that's where the parasitical method, I think, really begins. You know what I'm saying? So we can take, we can take Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's concepts with a sort of sober awareness of the design mm. of the community that he's trying to steer mm. us towards. You know, 
so it's, I mean, actually, I want to get onto the community building aspect because precisely because of the elitism of this community, and particularly about sort of the just the heavy emphasis you put on Nietzsche's anti-egalitarianism, which of course stretches back from the fact, as you say, we do kind of ignore the fact that within Nietzsche's lifetime, we have the 1848 revolutions and of course the Paris Commune, all within memory. I mean, I mean, Nietzsche was famously acquainted with young Hegelians who are writing at the time. You have David Strauss, Bruno and Edgar Bauer. I mean, what does it mean to confront this anti-egalitarianism then? Because in terms of, I think that's where I find some more sympathies with Nietzsche, not in the sense of his particular anti-egalitarianism, but against the more sort of standard assumes sort of egalitarianism on the left, not only from a kind of Adornian sort of critique of, well, yes, we're all equal to capital at the end of the day. Yes, <laughs> that's the problem of the of the identity of the value form at this point. But also from perspective of going back to that original um quote from Louis Blanc that Marx takes up, from each according to their ability to each according to their needs, in which the conditions of, of possibility of, of materials, of wealth, material, comfort, material, survival, have been detached from eco the economics of, of value, and therefore we don't need to be equal to all get, get what we need, in a sense. Not in a sense of an ontological e equality, but no longer needing this, this formal dimension. And I know you have a very strong response to this from the Lenin's tradition, so I just want to kind of just yeah. lead you along the path to try to extract yeah. some, some beautiful surplus value here. <laughs> sure. So part of this, I think, has to be understood as how liberalism conceives of equality first and foremost, uh, because bourgeois equality is sort of conflated with liberty insofar as liberty is the equality is relegated to what the market determines. So immediately equality is subordinated to the law of competition. It's subordinated to the domination of the market. And in that way, Marx stands as a profound critic, especially of equality as one of the main sort of values that the Jacobins, you know, the far left uh, expression of the French Revolution tried to bring into existence. But implicit within that is also a critique of liberalism on its own terms, right? That, um, well, your form of equality cannot be realized in the society in which wage labor continues to suppress uh, the full possibility of freedom for so many people. This problem of alienated labor makes equality and capitalism impossible in Marx's eyes. Now, Nietzsche enters into a similar debate, as does Marx, in this precise period of time. But his conclusions could not be more different than Marx, even though they both stand as staunch critics of bourgeois equality. In a way, what Nietzsche will say about equality, he does have a sort of premonition of a type of equality to come on condition that society remolds itself in a particular way, right? So there is a kind of future-oriented homage to inequality, to a conception of justice, to a conception of freedom in Nietzsche, right? Um, this notion of master morality has a homage to a future. This is why um, in Howard Cagill's reading of Marx and Nietzsche on the Paris Commune, I think that Cagill says that if Nietzsche would have known that the communards on the streets of Paris in 1871 possessed a future-oriented idea of the commune, then he might have had solidarity with them. Well, the immediate problem with that idea, I think, is that uh, Nietzsche commented actually quite widely on the commune. You see, there's, that goes back to the reading methods. A lot of Nietzschean scholars look only at his texts, which have a lot of esoter esoteric dimensions. They don't look at the epistolary Nietzsche. They don't look at much of the correspondence of the letters of his unpublished fragments, where we find that when the Paris Commune occurs, Nietzsche says, this is the saddest day of my life, precisely because he had learned that the communards burnt down the Louvre, the famous uh, museum. It was actually a rumor. They didn't do that. But even that rumor made him weep with tears. And in, so, so therefore, in a certain sense, um, it would not matter if the slave class, the proletarian class, 
possessed a future oriented because what matters in Nietzsche's eyes is the taming of this particular class. And that is a motif that repeats and repeats in Nietzsche's thought. So without attention to that, without attention to what Nietzsche truly means when he talks about this class, what he calls the impossible class in the gay science, um, I think that left Nietzscheans will miss out on this pugilistic and antagonistic relationship that we should have to him and that he had to the proletariat. Now, the problem of equality is obviously thought by Nietzsche in a much broader historical register, stretching back to the genealogical forebears of rationalism, Socratism. It's, it's a kind of um, problem for Nietzsche on multiple levels, not merely within reason, but it also has uh, physiological issues at work. So therefore, um, I don't see, Adam, the way that Marx's critique of equality, because you see, and this is where the kind of Marxist tradition has to be situated as well, can adequately connect or dialogue with Nietzsche's critique of equality. It can only do so at a certain point, and then at other points it has no sense to me. At the level of understanding the ruling class, the bourgeoisie, and its homage to equality as false. In a certain sense, both Marx and Nietzsche would agree that it's false. But on another sense, the preparatory work that needs to happen for the invention, okay, of an equality to come beyond capitalism in a transformed society, it is at that point that the Nietzschean artifice and prescriptions of how to do that become quite elitist and possibly quite problematic. I'll give you an example. In Jonas Sika's uh, new book, uh, How to Philosophize with a Hammer and Sickle, uh, what we find is a really interesting critique of a future communist society where the demands of the working class are not to be construed vis-a-vis -vis the tradition of rights. Right. So you have this kind of... Um, tradition coming out of French Revolution, which would argue that the rights of man, right, where equality kind of stems from, well, it stems from the spontaneous demands of the proletariat, you could say, right? In the Nietzschean presentation that Sika puts forward, he argues that we should encourage communist activity to not lean on a conception of rights. And it's here that I think that we enter into a problem from the standpoint of praxis and the prescriptions that we as leftist intellectuals are offering to the working class, let's say. Because I think, Adam, if you read Marx over the entirety of his work, one of the things you find is that Marx consistently advocates for the rights of the working class, and he has a particular set of rights that he wants to further, mainly leisure time, and mainly the lessening of the degradation of the horrors of immiseration from constant work and constant toil. What I show in my book is that Nietzsche has a calibrated interest in keeping relations of domination for the impossible class and the proletariat in place. That is part of the reason why liberal Nietzscheans have a solidarity with Nietzsche, because they also have to do that, because they support capitalism, right? So when we abandon a discourse on rights, okay, um, either in the present or in the future of a liberated society, this means an un, uh, this this results in a, in something that's too unhinged for me, precisely because it doesn't prevent us to do what I think is our core objective, right, which is to harness a sense of the collective interests of the broader working class towards emancipatory ends, okay. So these are some of my concerns, and I actually have a review of Sika's book that will be coming out hopefully soon. Um, I gained a lot from that work, but I also felt like there's, there's Nietzsche's critique of equality, which can be quite radical, quite militant, but also quite dangerous in some ways. I mean, when it comes to this question of the Marxist critique of rights, 
is it not so much a discourse about the nature or, or metaphysical essence of right itself, so much as it relies on a Marxist method of imminent critique, by which I mean you know, imminently comparing um, standards of the day to itself on a level of material disparity between the law and the distribution of property? Because to that extent, it, it, for example, I mean, Marx at one, I mean, Marx at one point in his career does say we, we advocate for the abolition of the rights of man in the German ideology. I mean, that's when he, that's, I mean, I love that text. It's the most anarchic Marx text. It's the text that I read as a Sterner scholar, and I'm like, well, damn, Marx is doing, he's cooking here, because I expect this to be this grand anti anarchic display of, of refutation of all this. And then they say, Sterner, you're a goddamn cop. Uh, we're going to abolish even more stuff at this point. Yeah, we're going to <laughs> abolish rights. We're going to abolish the economy. We're going to abolish, you know, you don't understand labor. And fair enough, with all this stuff. But in terms of the discourse of right, is it is it ultimately in the Marxist sense mostly about method against Nietzsche as opposed to about the conception of right? Would you say? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. It's a it's a question for me first and foremost around method, but I would say particularly around practice. Okay, because the democracies, so called, they were not true democracies at all that Marx and Engels were uh, writing about when they wrote the German ideology. Those were all explicit oligarchies uh, that were uh, ran by feudal aristocratic interests primarily. So this notion of a strong rebuke of the ossified rights of man, which of course they also acknowledge that at certain points in the class struggle, those rights of man had a universalizability, but only on condition of socialism as democracy. So in that way, it comes down to a question of strategy. Okay, and this is where the practical, this is why like the, we're not just talking in abstractions and PhD dissertations. Actually, I think because Nietzsche is so influential, okay, when we bring him into the left, that actually means that what we advocate as thinkers, as socialist actors, has sort of direct bearings. And so, for example, the democracy that we find today, I would argue, has to be worked with within the parliamentary system. Not necessarily in a reformist way, but has to be, uh, we have to sort of contend with the fact that the working class today exists in a defeated state. The question then becomes how will their defeat and their emiseration be revolutionized? And so my argument would be that um, strategically we have to use the levers of the state. Nietzsche, as we know, has a very seductive critique of the state, a very seductive critique of rights, a total critique in some sense. And so you see, what I worry about is the historical specificity of that practice being almost too anarchic. Now, of course, we can then mince and debate the question of anarchism and communism and socialism. That's a great debate to have. But I just think we should be sober about that particular influence that Nietzsche is bringing in. And it's not to say that Nietzsche always makes us anarchists when he appears on the left. I think that there are different forms that he can bring out in us, but this is one that I, that I do worry about. I hope that that makes oh, sense. Absolutely. I mean, if you, will, if you want to continue on the aspect of method, I mean, there's a there's a, a shadow of a of discourse beneath this book, and it's very much a minute, which is sort of trying to revive the work of Lukács, particularly the later Lukács of the destruction of reason against the critiques levied, levied against him by um, Adorno. And there's a, a real sort of like, sort of at, at the barricades defense of Lukács, actually, the book, I'm, if you don't mind, I'd like to read out. Um, so it really sort of grabbed me, which was, this is the quote, for Lukács and for any socially engaged intellectual, it was Hegelian philosophy that provided the comprehensive solution to the crisis of European society after the French Revolution. In this way, Hegel successfully resolved the German idealist project and brought philosophy to a comprehensive point of completion. That is, Hegelianism presented a rational account of society and history and a logical science of the new in which dialectical philosophy was now capable of addressing the contradictions of the social world through philosophy. Hegel gave philosophy a renewed social mission, which after Marx now implied a radical political and social mission. And the reason I bring this up is because it feeds a lot back into your critique of Nietzsche using these particularly the Catchian um, categories of a rationalism, 
and also talking about Hegel. But how much is Hegel a specter in the critique of Nietzsche as sort of the, the, the grand alternative here? And I'm wondering as well where methods of the reading that you apply to Nietzsche might also be helpful as well in the further exposition of Hegel, because he's also, in a sense, on a huge revival. And it's not in the same way that Hegel comes to the left in the same way Nietzsche does. Hegel comes to the left via Marx. But the relationalist very mm. tendentious mm. point of theory, yes, but also on the level of, of practical applications on the level of dialectical education. Mm -hmm. Yes. So part of what I get from Lukács is sort of, on one hand, it's a kind of philosophical argument that we don't have the time to fully unpack, but let me try to sort of simply state the, the problem at hand. Um, Neo-Kantianism puts forward a conception that social antagonisms in capitalist society are largely kind of unknowable. There's, there's, there's a sort of um, problem of um, man's access to the knowability of the system, right? This is what Marx calls totality. And so Lukács identifies a direction of social and political philosophy after Neo-Kantianism. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, Kant puts forward this notion of the unknowability of the thing in itself. Well, in the wake of that Copernican revolution in philosophy, philosophers in German idealist tradition and beyond will start to interpret social reality as also unknowable. And that is what Lukács means by irrational. So um, irrational philosophy is not to be understood as merely a break from the paradigm of sufficient reason and logical proofs and things of that nature. No, it's a very particular form of a construal of social life and social suffering in particular as fundamentally unknowable. And so uh, what Lukács instructs us with is this lineage of this particular form of interpretation onto social reality. So it becomes a question of the knowability of so shared social ills and shared social wrongs. Like one of my favorite French philosophers, Jacques Rancière, has this idea that's kind of close to this notion, which is that politics doesn't begin until two groups have a dispute over what constitutes a wrong, right? And so that's kind of where the irrationalism in some sense, sense falls, which is the irrationalist will say, look, you know, uh, we can't determine the, the, the knowability of the wrong in some sense. And so they occlude that. Whereas in the Hegelian tradition, which we could identify in the long sweep of the rationalist point of view on this issue, there would be the affirmation that there is the possibility of collective knowledge of social wrongs, of social ills, and therefore philosophy should be inducted in the class struggle as a sort of effort of revealing and accessing the dialectical logics of social antagonisms in capitalist social life, right? So like, if like racism in capitalism is ultimately generated by class struggle as its kind of unacknowledged underbelly, right? The Hegelian orientation would be to sort of show how that works, to show that logic of racialized capitalism and to reveal it. What I see Nietzscheanism as doing is being aware, right, of that dialectic, but trying to subvert it into a more radicalized, irrationalist unknowing of it. And then I therefore argue that we can understand the core of Nietzsche's political intents and his concepts through this prism of a refusal of the knowability of the absolute. This is also what uh, Lukács calls aristocratic epistemology. So the notion of the knowability of social conflict. It's not only that it's not knowable. No, Nietzsche says it's knowable, but only by an elect. Okay, so there you, so there you see he's such a dialectical thinker. And if you don't see him on this terrain of a political intention, you don't, you don't get to dance with him. So my argument for the left is like, let's dance with Nietzsche, right? Like, let's, let's engage with this dance, because he's already dancing. He's already dancing over cap under an understanding of capitalism. So irrationalist philosophy has a whole lineage we could talk about and uh, unearth, but that's sort of the idea. And that is a different reading of Hegel than the kind of Zizekian reading of Hegel that we're familiar with, right? It's a, um, 
it's a Lukacian reading, right? It's it's a it's a reading of the standpoint of the proletariat. It's a reading of the, the idea, right, that socialist philosophy, right, should be about generating collective interests for liberation and rationally identifying social ills that we share in common and building solidarities to address them. It's a pretty um I don't know, uh, modest Hegelianism. It's a kind of applied social political Hegelianism, but with the twist that only Marx is able to fully unearth this, this process. So it's not like a notion that we must return to Hegel and Hegel is enough. It means that Hegel opens up a, a sort of social vocation for the intellectual. That's the key point. And of course, there's a whole historical, fascinating history of that, like how intellectuals respond to that call um, and how, the, how so, uh, intellectuals uh, flee from that call. I consider Nietzsche a philosopher who flees from that social call. And what is that social call? That social call is the construction of a world that would be modeled on a universal, that would be. Um, for the achievement and the furthering of an egalitarian promise, right? Now, this is also where Nietzsche comes in with, of course, his critique of teleology. So we have to, so you see, everywhere you go, he is, he appears, right? Um, this is why he's a sort of inescapable presence. You know what I mean? So th this is what I would say about that. There's much more to be said, but this is a snapshot of my my thinking. Well, to sort of further it in a slightly pithy question, does Marx read Hegel like a parasite? Mm. Definitely, of course. Yeah, I mean, in the sense that um, it depends on, uh, well, first of all, I would say this, a parasitical reading is more than simply an appropriation, mm. right? Mm. It is also an acknowledgement. You see, because I follow Lukács' notion in the Young Hegel, mm. in his text on yeah. the Young Hegel, which says what? Which says that Hegel only turned to a reactionary conception of politics in the philosophy of right um, as a, as a um, acknowledgement that his early youthful pro-Jacobin positions were unrealizable in bourgeois society. So it was a compromise. So therefore, the young Hegel is Marx uh, in utero, is Marx uh, uh, in the laboratory, you see? Is Marx without a critique of political economy. Hmm? So therefore, it's not the same type of parasitism, because you see, Nietzsche is already a determined figure of reaction. Now, of course, when you say a determined figure of reaction, we have to qualify that by saying that, well, figures of reaction are everywhere. Um, they need to be seen and confronted, you know, head on, right? And parasitized in some cases, right? So, so I would say it's, it's qualified by that. And I would also say that with Hegel, it's much less clear the determination of his reaction. It's much less clear than it is with Nietzsche. And so therefore, I think there is a parasitism, but it's not the same extent as the type that I'm advocating here with Nietzsche. Um, also because Hegel, uh, Hegel does not think a form of community in the same way as does um, Nietzsche. He, he, Nietzsche's form of community is uh, so rare and so... Um, you could say elitist, that you have to, if you want to truly um, unveil its logics, you have to sort of enter in from within. That's another notion of being a parasite, because Nietzsche, uh, in a technical sense, invokes the notion that all ubermensch, all overmen, have many, many parasites that live on them. And so there is a sort of theory of uh, leadership, you could say, that parasitism is also meant to overcome in some sense. So it's sort of this notion that um, you have to know the master's tools to overcome the master. So you have to face him as a master, and you also have to face Nietzsche as a victor in some ways. 
Um, and I'll be very curious to see what left Nietzscheans think about this idea, because I think, Adam, that a lot of left Nietzscheans mm. don't really, they don't really read Nietzsche as a victor. What does it look like to read him as sort of already achieved something? That'll be curious to see but what they say about this proposition. It does remind me of the phrase um, from Nietzsche from the genealogy of morals, where he says, you know, it's his sort of your anti-revenge position of, you know, uh, yeah, it made my parasites grow fat on me. What do I care for my parasites? I've got enough to go around kind of thing. And that's I've always sort of loved that particular kind of phrasing. I mean, it's it's interesting to talk about actually the, the accessibility of Nietzsche's community versus Hegel's. Because you can't get in Hegel doesn't have a community in one sense, in the sense of followers. He does have a community, you just can't get in. Uh, which is which is you have to be within the historical time frame of you know, Central Europe, the Germanic era. If you're in Siberia or Africa, it's tough luck. Um, you can be mm -hmm. enslaved. You can get into it by being mm -hmm. enslaved, mm -hmm. and that's about it, really. Um, and as, as, as a recovering Hegelian and recovering Nietzschean, I'm constantly torn between these these two poles. But let, let, let's wrap off just uh, just just actually with one of your best examples, I think, of this parasitical form of reading, and a thinker whose yes. Nietzscheanism I was actually introduced to recently through um, through Billy Cashmore and her book uh, "We Here Only Ourselves," which leans in quite a lot of this, yes. which is. Uh, particularly the left Nietzscheanism of Huey P. Newton, uh, a man who definitely knew how to read like a parasite. Um, I mean, absolutely. Just, because I know he's one of your main paradigmatic thinkers of left Nietzscheanism, along with uh, Jack London, G. Deleuze, George Bataille, except Wendy Brown. But I think New Newton's where I think some of the positive kind of aspects of the reading methods really sort of shine through here and as a historical sort of. Um, artifacts or well reality yeah yes so the black panther organization was indebted to a nietzschean conception of who will to power uh, without question and part of that was a reading of the political scene in a moment of defeat this is an interesting interesting point which is the civil rights movement had kind of formally been achieved but it was a half measure. It was it was sort of um, not. It didn't extend to the lumpen proletariat, to the underclass. The the black proletariat was still obviously highly oppressed, and so on. Even after the civil rights movement, and so on. Right. So Newton diagnoses the psychological condition of black underclass people as in a condition of passivity. Yeah, I don't think he'd say resentment, but let's say passivity, okay? He's reading um, Nietzsche's notions of transvaluation of values, okay? And understanding the linguistic and discourse, even before discourse theory became popular, okay? And he's thinking um, words uh, latch on to the affective structure of the human in various ways, and they become the site of how we project political values. So Newton comes up literally with a strategy for doing what? Radicalizing the consciousness of the black underclass by reforming the meaning of the word cop. And Newton is really responsible, I show. I mean, I, res I rely on, I wasn't the first to show this, by the way, of course. Others have shown this. Um, he invented the notion of pig, okay? And now everyone knows that when you say pig, this associates with a cop. This was a Nietzschean strategy for the radicalization of black consciousness, precisely in the sense that if the cop is rendered in an intuitive sense as a pig, this will produce a depacification of black workers in relationship to the authority of the police, mostly of whom are white. Okay, so that's an example of a parasitical reading in the sense that, um, well, Nietzsche himself uh, was pretty much adamantly opposed to the class-based worldview of the Panthers and to the undergirding demands and desire of the Panthers. But um, on truth and lying in an extra moral sense, a very short fragment from Nietzsche. You can read it as just a few paragraphs. You see the invitation 
for this reinvention of language and words, which is exactly what Newton did. Okay. So that's a parasitical reading. That's, that's a great example of this. And there's others. Okay. Um, but that, that would be how I would frame the Newton piece. I think, no, I think that's a good way of framing it, particularly. I mean, especially when it comes to, I mean, even when it comes to some of Huey P. Newton's use of, and I'm, it, it's hard to say this in a sense in our conversation, slightly less politicized or political in origin, but nonetheless abstractable on the level of their somewhat uh, abstract metaphysical character. When, for example, uh, Newton talks about the will to power, which is more interesting as a reading of the will to power as a concept than it is as a reading of Nietzsche, I guess. And I think that's one of the mind in terms of, I mean, I'm not a left Nietzschean. I'm a big appreciator of them, but I'm not, I mean, I'm not a left Nietzschean. But in regards to stuff like the theories of forces, the particular kind of psychodynamics at play here, is, 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 because that's not as heavily focused on the politicization. It's more in the sort of the itself a political genealogy of why was he even talking about this in the first place? What was he writing about as he was reading these supposedly apolitical aspects? I mean, do you think there's anything in this kind of ontologization of forces that could nonetheless be helpful? I mean, in terms of parasitization, I mean, even going as far as yeah. the use, the fusion of Marx and Nietzscheanism that comes out in something like the anti Oedipus or something, or um, somewhat something to do with ne yeah. some like Negri, less Asafal, because Asafal was very elitist. It was this idea of we were going to start an order mm -hmm. of communist monks and we was going to create a new religion for everyone. Yeah. Fair enough. It, bang to rights on those guys. Bang to rights. But there's this aspect which I still hold on to, which is this lineage of Nietzsche read through people like Deleuze in terms of this a new history of transcendental philosophy, a new history of imminent philosophies mm -hmm. as a kind of a new way of thinking mm -hmm. about forces, which you can get from early Schelling, you can get from later Kant, and it even to the extent mm -hmm. in Hegel, but it's very much opposed to the Hegelianism, although I wouldn't say dialectics. I think Nietzsche, I think Deleuze is doing that of his own time, but there's some recent scholarship by people like Grant Maxwell, which is quite good on this. But in terms yeah. of the, the metaphysics here, do you think there's anything really that, that politics doesn't infect it's really is, can we just never scrub any of this off or is it just can we keep the knowledge in mind we use these or does it fundamentally transform these concepts in the manner of an imminent critique of their origin yeah i worry that it fundamentally transforms them through this notion i referred to a moment ago vis-a-vis -vis a irrationalist conception what often happens in when we metaphorize or immunitize or, or render our conception of will to power um, outside of the, a more vulgar application of them, and we can talk about how vulgar applications of will to power have played out in thinkers like Mussolini in his reading of Nietzsche, um, in thinkers like H.L. Mencken in his reading of Nietzsche, and right Nietzscheans. But let's say, so what's the meaning of a less vulgar? In invocation in Foucault and Deleuze and Bataille and others. Um, it varies. It's not just one, but often, okay, and this is a whole topic for a future debate, conversation, podcast, and so on. Often, what I worry about, Adam, is this notion of um, a certain spiritual conception of the human as always prone to an overwhelming of reactive forces within them that then becomes translated into a sort of analysis of reaction that becomes too difficult to discern the granularity of actual reaction and so on. So we then end up kind of like we talked about with Rousantiman, conceiving of power as what Nikos Palancis accused Foucault of, right? Which is your conception of power at the end of the day is that power is so omnipotent that we have no means to dialectically sublate it. We are sort of caught within it. And then we become unbeknownst to ourselves, caught in a kind of theological register. So that becomes um, a question which Alain Badiou would accuse Deleuze of, right? Um, which is you become a new saint. You become a new ascetic priest. So you've undermined your whole point because Nietzsche has a critique of the ascetic priests. So you see, he then returns to us. I, brought, I was listening to an interview with Ray Brassier and he's like, this is the vicious circle of Nietzsche. You see, you, does that make sense? 
So um, we're tethering with him. We're tethering with him. There's not one way this appears. There's multiple ways it appears. But I do worry, right, that for my interest in this praxis of the development of collective rational interests and class-based solidarities, what I worry about is this conception and construal of a field of impersonal power that can basically lead to conclusions that return us to Nietzsche's pathos of distance insofar as, uh, well, the revolutionary vanguard are a rare cohort that have found an exit from this, whereas, you know, large mass, the masses, this is Nietzsche's anti-masses notion coming back, either cannot escape resentment or they're mired in these forms of impersonal power for which they, so, so Nietzsche's inviting us to a kind of exercise and acrobatics, a dance to escape these forms. The question becomes, um, what are the terms for escape? Can we generalize the terms of escape in a way that is truly universal and legible for political action that doesn't unintentionally reproduce elitist structures? And I said unintentionally, um, uh, you, you see my point. These are some of my baseline concerns. It requires a further debate, discussion, comradely engagement, you know, but these are definitely concerns I think that are valid. Absolutely. I mean, we've already gone past the hour. So I, I, we, we, we could speak about this for, as you said, possibly years, well, possibly years to come in the future. <laughs> but there will, there will be an eventually some sort of philosophical showdown with someone who's far more legion than myself. I will be in the, in, the, in the referee's ring being like, okay, no, hold up. Hermeneutics of innocence, that's one point off. We're subtracting this. No, you have insufficiently dialectical, unserious. No, two points off. But in the meantime, all I have to say is, Daniel, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's my pleasure. It was an honor and very enjoyable. I hope that people enjoy the book and that it starts conversations, discussions like we had today. Yep, there will be there will be updates on our events page over at repeaterbooks.com for upcoming events with Daniel. Uh, of course, there will also be links to the trailer that Comrade Scribe will put together for the book. There will, of course, be links, links to the book itself and the audio book, which are both out now. Buy it now. Buy it now. I mean, otherwise, if you would you want to leave an eternal recurrence in which you didn't buy this book? If your answer to that is no, Go out and buy the book. Anyway, in the meantime, I'll catch you folks later. We appreciate your support of the imprint and the channel. Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.